Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Ward Bond in Catherine Haviland Taylor's The Failure on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a story called The Failure by Catherine Haviland Taylor. Now, what is a failure? Who can rightly call himself one? These are the questions you'll probably ask, and they are the questions that the writer intended you to ask, since her story asks them itself. And I think when you heard it, you may feel that her story could also and equally have been called the success. It's certainly a success as a story, and it's a heartwarming chronicle of a plain man's life which might well be the life of countless plain men who never make the headlines. There have been a good many stories about doctors, but none, I think, which so stresses the humility and selflessness of the profession. And we are happy to present in the leading role of the failure that fine Hollywood actor, Mr. Ward Bond. And now, Frank Oss, how about a word from you? There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, that says you cared enough to send the very best. <laughs> Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Catherine Haviland Taylor's The Failure, and starring Ward Bond. My dear nephew, tonight I've been sitting here in my office and some long thoughts have been chasing themselves around inside of me. Suddenly, I found myself wanting to write them down. When a man gets to be my age and the realization dawns on him that he's a failure and it's too late to do anything about it, he starts poking around the ashes of years past, trying to figure out how it happened and just where the golden opportunities eluded and escaped him. I've been sitting here listening to voices and words that were spoken a long time ago. Words that were milestones, and yet some of which I had completely forgotten. And among them, I realize now, were the actual voices of beckoning success. The day I got the papers that said I was a doctor, one of the city's top surgeons sent for me. I was feeling far more idealistic than practical as I sat there listening to him. I have done a great deal of thinking about who I would like to have as an assistant. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no one I'd rather have than you. Well, thank you, sir. That's, that's very good of you, but you see, I, I, I sort of planned on going back to Pleasanton. My father had a great many patients there. He was the only doctor in the town, you know, and I've felt a certain responsibility since his death. As a matter of fact, I'm going to practice there this summer. Pleasanton? Do you mean to tell me that you're going to bury yourself in that one-horse town for the sake of a charity practice? Or you'll be an overworked, underpaid hack? And you won't contribute one thing to medicine. Dr. Watt, you'd better listen to me. Or one day you'll look in your mirror and see a man old before his time. A failure. It was late the next night when I got to Pleasanton. My mother was sitting up waiting for me. I told her about Dr. Bartlett's offer. She didn't have much to say. Well, son, you'll have to think it out for yourself. What's this box of walnuts on the desk, Mother? Ed Willoughby dropped those by this morning. He said it was part payment for opening the boil on his little girl's neck. Oh, I see. Yes, come in. 
Evening, Miss White. Evening, Eli. Evening, Andy. Evening. My girl, she burned herself. Spilled an oil lamp. Bad? Pretty bad. How much for coming out, Eli? How much will you pay? Fifty cents. And not one cent more. All right. I'll be right with you. <laughs> days of that summer were busy. Mentally, I had already begun to look upon my practice in Pleasanton as temporary, and I hurried from bedside to bedside, trying to do as much as I could against the day when I wouldn't be there to do anything. How's the patient, Aggie O'Brien? She's going to be all right. Oh, praise be to God. Oh, I'm tired. You got anything to eat? Oh, I got a nice pot of stew for you. Well, who paid us off in meat? Mark Peters. For his mother-in-law's gallbladder. Well, good for Mark Peters. <laughs> Mrs. Arnheim was by. She said she'd drop by again tomorrow. She had no business out of bed. I told her to rest. She wanted to spare you the trip out there. It's pretty hard for a woman with five kids to stay in bed. She says if you can keep her above ground till next year when Molly's 14, why then Molly can do for the kids. <laughs> do they actually think that I can measure their time? Grant their request to stay alive until the kids can manage... Mom, do they think that I'm... I'm God? Some of them do. And the ones that don't are pretty sure you have a speaking acquaintance with him. Bill, come on in. Hi, Doc. I brought down a couple of chickens. I put them out in the coop. <laughs> Didn't know whether it was too late to knock or not, but I saw your light. Oh, I was just sitting here thinking things over. Susan said a couple of chickens wasn't much in exchange for a baby, but we'll send some more down when we can. That's all right. Doc, I... You don't know what a difference you've made in our lives just in these few months. You're one of us. You understand us. Why, when you tell Rachel Carson she's going to be better, she believes you and she starts getting better. Well, I'd better be moving on. Susan will start worrying. Well, give her my love. I'll do that. Night, Doc. Night, Bill. Oh, God. I know I'm weak. And I hope you'll see your way clear to forgive me, but... I've got to pass the opportunity by. I've just got to stay here in Pleasanton. I knew as I sat there that I was just going to plug along and end up a failure. Mother died soon after that. And then your father, Jimmy, and your mother and you came to live with me. And of all the voices I remember, it is your voice I remember loudest and clearest. <laughs> hey, what's going on out here? I threw rocks at a girl. Well, that wasn't very nice, was it, Jimmy? Why did you throw rocks at a girl? Because she was a girl. I don't like girls. Why? Because they're girls. Where are you going? On a case. What company? Well, there's nothing I'd like better. Hop in. You know something? What? When I grow up, I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to cut people open and take other pains and sew them up again. <laughs> so you want to be a doctor? Just like you. We'll make you a better doctor than I am. We'll manage Vienna for you, Jimmy. Uncle Eli, you're the best doctor in the world. Well, suppose we just say that I'm the best doctor in Pleasanton. Outside of Pleasanton, I'm a... Well, that's another story, Jimmy. That's another story. In a moment, James Hilton will return to bring you the second act of The Failure, starring Ward Bond. Sometimes, in a moment of inspiration, an author will write a phrase, a sentence, 
that illuminates his whole philosophy as though it were a flash of lightning. And this is the case with William Hazlitt, the famous English literary critic. Perhaps it was out of his admiration for the great dramatists of Shakespeare's time that Hazlitt one day wrote this simple but profoundly thoughtful sentence. Words are the only things that last forever. Certainly it was a deep respect for words that made him write with such care that we still read his essays more than a century after they first appeared. The makers of Hallmark greeting cards recognize the importance of words, know that the effect of one simple greeting, well expressed, may last a lifetime. And so they are as careful of the words they put into greeting cards for you to send as they are of every other detail of their making. That is why, whether it's Valentine's Day or any other occasion, you will always find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. See how true this is when you buy the Valentines you'll soon be sending. As you select them, look on the back for the identifying hallmark. Your friends will see it too and know you cared enough to send the very best. And now we present the second act of Catherine Haviland Taylor's The Failure, starring Ward Bond. Yes, Jimmy, tonight I've been sitting here writing to you, sorting out some memories and some words that were said a long time ago. At 12, Jimmy, you thought I was the greatest doctor in the world. At 16, you were telling me that the thing to do was to manage a practice, but not to let it manage you. At 17, you saw that I was a country doctor who would never expand. And at 22, you were telling me how the big fellows did it. At 22, you realized what I'd always known you must someday. Oh, don't misunderstand me, Uncle Eli. Isn't that I think you're a failure or anything, but oh, people have different ways of doing things now. You have to keep up with the times. Yes, I realize that, and I do what I can, Jimmy. Say, I have to ride out in the country on a case. Would you like to come along? <laughs> no, I've got some studying to do. I have a big exam coming up. Jimmy, I can't tell you how very proud I am of you. You're exactly the kind of a doctor I dreamed of you being. Successful, prominent, prosperous. Last month when I took Rebecca Kyle to your hospital in the city, I wanted to tell you that, but it was a busy day for you. Come in. Oh, hello, Uncle. You like money? Uh, I brought in Rebecca Kyle, Jimmy. Oh, yes. Uh, operation scheduled for Thursday. Yes, Thursday at 10. Jim, I'm sure she'd feel easier if she could talk to you before the operation. Oh, now, look, Uncle Eli, I just took this case as a favor to you. I have a lot to do before Thursday. The Kyle case is a very simple operation. Well, I know, but there's a, a psychological thing involved here. Becky isn't any too strong, and she seems to feel that she's not going to pull through it. Oh, nonsense. I never lost a case like this in my life. Well, of course, if you're busy... Well... I have a full week, Uncle Eli. Uh, you coming to the medical association meeting? Well, I'm going to try, but Hilda Archer's baby has pneumonia, and I have to be around considerable. I guess you remember Hilda. She used to be Hilda Jones, and she lived in that big house down on Elm Street. Uh, look, I'm afraid I have to run, Uncle Eli. I have a luncheon and an operation at two. Nice case, and I get paid money. <laughs> it's nice stuff to have in the bank. Yes, I guess it is, but some make it and some don't. There are compensations. How Cynthia? Oh, wonderful. She was asking about you last night. Oh, she's a nice girl. Mm-hmm. She has just about everything a man hopes to find in a wife. Is it all set? Looks that way, well, congratulations. You're a lucky man. <laughs> I think so. Oh, look, now, I've got to hustle if I'm going to meet Babcock on time. Babcock? The Babcock? The one that wrote all those books on... That, uh, that's right. That's the old boy. Well, Jimmy, he's been a hero of mine for a long time. What does he look like? <laughs> like a lot of other people. Say, you might tell him if the opportunity presents itself and you think he'd be interested that... His writings have meant a lot to one old country doctor. I'll do that. I'll see you later, Uncle Eli. Sorry to have to run out on you like this, but you know how it is. Jimmy. 
Jimmy, I was glad that you were going to have lunch with Babcock. You see, he was the one man I had always wanted to meet more than any other. On the way back to Pleasanton, I stopped and picked out a posy and sent it over to Cynthia as a sort of an engagement remembrance. A few days later, she came out to see me. Dr. Watt, I can't... I can't marry Jim. Oh, I see. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but if you can't, you can't. That's all there is to it. I wanted to explain to you. You see, Jim hasn't any idea at all what is important in life. Everything you have, he's missed. Everything I have? Everything. Friendship, love, admiration, sense of proportion, a sense of values. And you don't think Jim has those things? No. When was the last time he was out here to see you? Oh, now, you must remember, he has a lot to do at the hospital. The people in this town are his people. They don't seem to mean a thing to him. Dr. Eli Watt is a human being. Jim's a complete washout, a failure. Well, Cynthia, I, I don't know quite what to say to you. Excuse me. Hello? Yes, Jim. Oh, she has. Uh -huh. I see. All right, I'll come right in. What is it? Becky Kyle, Jim wants me to go right down to the hospital. <laughs> with her for hours. I've tried everything I know. The, the operation was a success. Her, her charts have been satisfactory, but she just isn't putting up a fight. Doesn't seem to have any will to live. She'll die if something can't be done. Well, she may be just obsessed with the idea that she's going to die. Let me have a talk with her. You want to come along? May I, sir? Well, of course. Becky, Becky, it's Dr. Eli. Becky, open your eyes and look at me. Becky, open your eyes. Mm. That's better. No, 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 don't, don't close them. I want you to look at me. That's right. You know, it's mighty nice out in Pleasanton. The lilacs by your house are coming out. And Ted fixed that board that was loose in the front steps. And the other night when I stopped by to see how he and Tilly were making out, he was out in the kitchen trying to iron her dresses. <laughs> you should have heard the language he was using over that iron. You know, he's coming in again tomorrow to see you. How's my baby? I saw her this morning. She was crying for you. Oh, when she cries, she won't eat. That's right. But you see, Becky, we promised her you'd be home today. You promised her? Yes. And you could have been? I could have been. Why, sure. The operation was a success. You're just wasting your time lying here in bed now. You mean it, Doctor? You really mean it? Haven't I always told you the truth? Straight out, Becky. Yes. Well, tell her. Tell her I'll, I'll be home on Monday. I'll tell her. I'll tell her, Becky. Yes, Jimmy, I've been sitting here thinking over a lot of words and what they meant to me as I listened to them and stored them away for future reference. It was only a few days after Becky Hakaya left the hospital that you asked me if I would attend the County Medical Association dinner with you. I was very proud that you had asked me to go with you. And I was sorry that I was late, but... Mary Smith's baby was born, and it was a long and hard delivery. I was surprised that no one had started to eat when I got there. I stood in the doorway, and then somebody pointed out a place to me. It was at the head of the table. 
I thought there was some mistake, but I was hungry, so I pitched in and started to eat. You, uh, <laughs> seem hungry, Doctor. Well, I am. I, I haven't eaten since this morning. Oh, I don't believe we've met. My name is Watt. I'm from Pleasanton. My name's Babcock. Babcock? Oh, gentlemen. Gentlemen, as you all know, this dinner is in honor of my uncle, Dr. Eli Watt. In, in honor of what did he say? Yes, in honor of you, Dr. Watt. That's why we're here. Last month, he saved the life of a patient of mine, Becky Kyle through the knowledge and use of applied psychiatry. Well, that was one case. Through the many years of his life, he saved thousands of Becky Kyles. He's brought them into the world, bound up their skinned knees, treated their dogs and their cats, sat by their bedsides, loved them, prayed for them, wept over them, brought them hope and courage by just appearing when they were ill and many times gave them added years to live before he left. I'm proud that I'm related to him, just as every gentleman on this board must be proud to know him. He's a fine and good man, and in my opinion, the most successful man among us. Gentlemen, gentlemen, Jimmy, you do me far more honor than I deserve. Thank you, and God bless you for this moment. What? Dr. Watt, come in. I, I know it's late, Cynthia, but I was just passing by, and I wanted to tell you what has happened to me tonight. Babcock was on my right, Cynthia. Babcock on my right. Oh, come in, come in. Tell me all about it. I knew you'd want to know because Jim arranged it. It was a testimonial dinner. Everyone in the County Medical Association was there, and Babcock asked me if he could come and talk to me about a case. Jim did it. Yes, he did, Cynthia. Darling, would you like to give him a message for me? Would you tell him that I've changed my mind? Tell him that I think he might turn out to be something like you, after all. And on the strength of that, I'll be very proud to marry him. Will you tell him that? I'll write it in a letter tonight. And I'll put it all down just as you said it. It was after two by the time I got home. And as I sat down and started to write this letter, the telephone rang. This is Mike Seafee. Please, could you come right over? The missus is bad. I knew there was 10 miles ahead of me as I started my car. But the thought of the miles didn't tire me as they sometimes did late at night. I was feeling young again, and I, I found myself thinking that with luck, I could go on for a good many years longer. I looked up and the stars were bright and close through my windshield. And I said to them, as so many of my patients had said to me, just a little more time, a little more time. And so I arrived at Mike Seafee's, went in to his wife's bedside. It's all right now, Mary. Everything's going to be all right now. The doctor's here. And Jimmy, as I stood there, I suddenly realized that it was these words that kept me in Pleasanton all these long years. It was my patient's faith in me that gave me faith in myself. It was these words that had been telling me for so many years that I was not a failure. But I'd never really heard them before tonight. It's all right now. Everything's going to be all right now. The doctor's here. Jimmy, 
May you hear those words over and over through all the days that you live. In a moment, James Hilton and Ward Bond will return. But now I'd like to remind you that it's time to start thinking about Valentine's because Valentine's Day is only a little more than two weeks away. You'll find so many different Hallmark Valentines to choose from, it's easy to find just the right one to send every person who is dear to you. A Valentine that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And here's a very special Valentine treat that Hallmark has prepared for the youngsters. It's Hallmark's Make Your Own Valentines. They're so easy to make, it's loads of fun. And they're so beautiful, children just love them. In one make-your-own kit are bright red cards, lacy white panels, tiny golden hearts, and cute little figures to fasten on each valentine. A little bear, a baby duckling, a toy horse. Eight different figures. There's material for 16 valentines in this kit, which sells for a dollar. Or you can buy a smaller package of materials for only 50 cents. Find Hallmark Make Your Own Valentine Kits at the Friendly Store where you buy your Hallmark greeting cards. Here again is James Hilton. As I remarked at the outset of tonight's play, this story could appropriately have been called a success. And now that you've heard it, I'm sure you'll agree not only on that, but also that our guest tonight, Mr. Ward Bond, certainly helped to make our presentation a thoroughly dramatic success. Thank you, Ward Bond, for a splendid performance. My thanks to you, Mr. Hilton. Every once in a while, an actor gets to play the part of some character that is particularly close to him. The character of Eli Watt did that for me tonight. Maybe it's because I'm a country-bred boy myself, but the doctor, the country doctor, is something that is tied up with the tradition of our country, a part of a pattern of living that is unforgettable. He's had a lot more to do with keeping people happy than many of us realize. While I'm on it, so do your fine Hallmark greeting cards in something of the same way. They bring a lot of happiness and good cheer wherever they make a call on anyone. Thank you, Mr. Hilton, for inviting me tonight, and thank all the Hallmark people for me. You're welcome anytime, Mr. Bond. And may I add that next week we have something rather special, both as to our story and our star. We shall dramatize the early life story of Abraham Lincoln from one of the literary classics of our time, Carl Sandburg's masterpiece, The Prairie Years. And in the great role of Lincoln himself, we shall present one of Hollywood's truly great stars, Gregory Peck. And the following week, when we shall all be in a Valentine mood, we shall present a memorable love story, smiling through with another great star, Lou Ayres. And the week after that, we shall be proud to, to welcome Joan Fontaine in Random Harvest. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and our story tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight's story came through the courtesy of Miriam C. Cooper, who with John Ford produced the forthcoming picture, Mr. Joseph Young of Africa. Ward Bond can currently be seen in the RKO release, Joan of Arc. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next Thursday when James Hilton will return to present Carl Sandburg's The Prairie Years, starring Gregory Peck and the following week, Smiling Through, starring Lou Ayres, and then Joan Fontaine in Random Harvest. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.